So I serve, as Marion said, as faculty director of the Canadian Studies Centre, and on behalf of the Jackson School of International Studies and all the sponsors of this event, which includes Herring Protectors, the Centre for American Indian and Indigenous Studies, the Centre for Human Rights, the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance, the Native American Law Centre, uh, in the University of Washington School of Law and the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you and at current count, there are nearly hundred of you here today uh, to today's landmark or perhaps more appropriately watershed events. Your moderator today is Charlotte Cote, Associate Professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. Dr. Cote is from the Nuchalnath community of Shisat on the west coast of Vancouver Island. She's the author of Spirits of Our Wailing Ancestors, Revitalizing Makah and Nichalnath Traditions, which raises issues concerning indigenous self-determination, eco-colonialism, and food sovereignty. Her current book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sockeye in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast, combines food and indigenous studies scholarship with personal memoir, stories, case studies, and indigenous language and philosophy to show how traditional foods play a major role in physical, emotional, spiritual and dietary wellness. Uh, and I, I just wanna point out briefly that we have many keepers of traditions on uh, today's panel, including linguistic traditions. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the Canadian Studies Center plays uh, what I believe is a major role in this work. Um, we offer graduate students and the occasional undergraduate the opportunity to learn uh, Nuchalnath and um, Inuktitut among other indigenous languages um, in Canada and uh, in the Northwest. So with that, I turn it over to Charlotte. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sharing with you my language and telling you that my Koas name or my indigenous name is Flotis Maiolth, which means carrying thunder. I am uh, Tishat, and Tishat is one of the groups that make up the larger nation of Nuchanolth, and our ancestral territory is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I welcome everyone here today. It's really good to see so many people interested in this very important topic. I want to acknowledge that where I live in Seattle and where the University of Washington is situated is the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish peoples. I acknowledge the lands and the shared waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, Puyallup, and Tulalip tribes, people recognized as Coast Salish. I am happy and honored to be serving as the moderator for this very important panel. The discussion you will hear today is framed within food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And as indigenous peoples, we understand how food sovereignty is central to our self-determination efforts and to regaining, maintaining and restoring the cultural and spiritual relationships we have with our ha'um, with our cultural or traditional foods. And in today's panel, representatives from the Tlingit, Tlingit and Haltzik nations and tribal law and natural resource management experts from both British Columbia and Alaska will discuss the state of the Pacific herring fisheries and what indigenous communities can learn <laughs> from each other and share across colonial borders. Our Haltzik relatives will discuss their success in regaining control over their fishery, and our Tlingit relatives will discuss the challenges they've experienced in fighting for their cultural right to harvest herring. In my language, herring eggs are called sihmu or kwakmas, and is a very important cultural ha'um or cultural food for the Nuchanlhat, the Nuchanlhat people. Herring and all our ha'um mean more to us than just a food source. They are our relatives and they are sacred. And we are bound to them in a circle of reciprocity. As Louise Brady has so beautifully stated, herring are precious and should be honored. And so I wanna open with that 
and now move into our panel discussion. And each panelist will have 10 minutes to speak. And once all of the speakers have shared, we will start the Q&A. If you have any questions for our panelists, please write them in the chat. And I believe uh, Ben will be overseeing the chat. So I want to begin with Louise Brady. Louise Brady is from the Tlingit Nation in Chitkakwan, an island off the coast of, the South, of Southeast Alaska. And she carries the name of Kashitla. Uh, she is Raven, uh, is she is Raven Frog of Kitsadi clan or Kitsadi clan. The Kitsadi women, known as the Herring Ladies, have a story or original instruction that connects them spiritually, culturally, and historically to Herring. Louise is the founder of the Herring Protectors, a grassroots movement of people that share concerns that the herring population in Shitkakwan and the culture tied to it are under threat. So I'd like to now bring forward Louise, Louise Brady. Thank you, honorable people. Thank you to the hosts of this uh, this morning's gathering, uh, virtual gathering. Good of cheese to all of the participants. Welcome, honorable people. My Tlingit name is Kashichla. I am Kiksadi. My I i am fortunate to live and work on my homelands. My people have been here since time immemorial. I am also a grandchild of the Kaguantan Wolf Clan, also here in Sitka. And as mentioned, we Kiksadi women are known as the Kahatja Sha or the Herring Ladies. Um, you can see part of the robe behind me, which is a representation of the herring lady. And originally in 1997, I helped organize a group of elders and culture bearers to testify before the Board of Fisheries, the state of Alaska. You know, our, our history with the herring is centuries old. Um, we have the, the Herring Rock, the story of the Herring Rock. It said that of all the places in Southeast Alaska, this is the first place that the Herring came. And it's because of the relationship of the Herring Lady, the original Herring Lady, who sang to the Herring and invited the Herring to come here, that the Herring come and bless us every spring. And the bounty of the Herring from all accounts before any fisheries is unfathomable. There are Russian accounts of a thousand people coming to Sitka Sound, coming to Shitka and staying on the islands. We're right on the Pacific Ocean. They would stay on the islands and come here specifically to harvest herring eggs. And another thousand people would come and stay in, in our villages around the sound. So to imagine that bounty and to think of what it's come to today and what our elders spoke to in 1997 about the herring, this particular herring fishery, the sacro herring fishery. What it does is it takes um, all of the herring in order to get the sacro. And so somebody put it as this fishery is 90% bycatch because they get the female herrings, they take the eggs, and then they grind up all of the herring. And it's used for either um, farmed salmon or pet food. And what a waste. Um, I really, um, if any of you live in a place where there is still a, a healthy herring stock, 
uh, you know what it's like when the herring come in. It's like nothing else. This spring was so spectacular. There's nothing like living in a place where there are herring, healthy herring stocks. Because I went to the beach and I saw eagles and seagulls and all kinds of every species of duck and um, ravens all together, and as well as whales just off the beach and um, all kinds of marine mammals. And what came to my mind when I went down there was like a, a cacophony of joy. Um, it was, it's such a joyful time. It's such an amazing time. It's such a spiritual time when the herring come in. And it's like, we wake up, you know, it's our, our reawakening. It's our rebirth every single spring. That's what the herring are for us. And sadly, um, the herring fishery has no, the, the fishery, the Board of Fish, the Western understanding of herring is, as, is a one dimensional resource. And the Sika tribe of Alaska started, like I said, in 1997 and probably even before that to go before the Board of Fish and with the same answer every single year, year after year after year. No, no, no. All you have is stories. You know, where is your science? We are using science to manage this fishery. And, and fortunately, um, in 19 or in 2016, there was a group of us that decided to do something different. And that was to do a ceremony for the herring. And I went to the, my clan leader and some other elders here locally and asked if it would be okay. And they agreed that it would be a good thing to do. And I think that is so important. It's been so important to us because that reestablishes our cultural, historical, but mostly our spiritual connection to the herring. And I think that our indigenous people are so used to not being listened to, to not being heard. Um, to have, um, have people say, you know, uh, we don't want to hear it unless it's, it's Western science. In fact, in 1997, when our first elder was testifying, I really had a hard time listening because you get three minutes. You get three minutes to testify before the Board of Fish. It's a really sterile um, place. You can see it in the film. You know, you can't, you, you, your access to the Board of Fish is limited and they actually have lights. So that our elder sat down and the green light, you start talking, the yellow light, you have a minute left and the red light, you stop. And <clears throat> our first elder who spoke, cause it's like to hear him cut off and to, you know, that the chair of the board said, no, stop. And I was like, I don't know that I want the rest of our elders to be in that. And so when we had the Kugi and invited the Board of Fish to our ceremony, a ceremony, you know, nothing to do with, with money, um, but a ceremony celebrating the herring, it was really beautiful to see our elders get up and speak and, and talk as long as they needed to about the importance of herring and just how far we have, <clears throat> how much we've lost as far as you know, our ability to harvest herring eggs. And herring eggs, I think this, this year we um, worked with a friend of mine, uh, Steve Johnson, who's a harvester and harvested 13,000 pounds and we had a gathering. You know, we were having yearly gatherings to celebrate that spiritual, cultural, historical connection. We we're able to give herring eggs out to the community. Um, Right now we're in the middle of uh, what's called the local um, advisory committee meetings and have not been very successful once again in the proposals that the Sika tribe has put forward. And that's to um, recognize that we as Sika tribal citizens and as Sika people need access, that we need access to the herring eggs because, uh, that's our right, <laughs> that's our human right to have access to these herring eggs. And it's been on the decline. And 
I think that what's important is that for us to get away, not to get away, but to add to the Western science, to add another dimension. Because I think that if we, at least at the Sikha tribe and Sheet Cup, continue to work only on the resource side, the natural resource and the extractive side, that we are going to, going to continue to see the challenges. So um, I hope that if you haven't seen the film, that you'll get a chance to see it. I also would like to invite um, everybody to come to our Yaokui uh, ceremony um, on April 16th of 2022. Uh, and I think one of the things that I know, we know as indigenous people is that anytime that we're fighting for our rights, anytime that you know, we are you know, addressing the injustices that it takes time, it takes time and it takes energy. And it is for me, um, it's a labor of love and passion for our children and our grandchildren. And we shall see. The Board of Fisheries is meeting again in January in Ketchikan, and we're organizing right now to see how many people we can get to testify. So we're doing this, you know, it's not only culture. I don't want to say not only culture, but there's also the organizing aspect to it. So I'm so excited to be here, to hear from our relatives across that false border to who have had so much success and to see the interest in this because you know um, it's been such a small group of people it's been probably five or six elders and culture bearers that have been going before the before the board of fish for the last 25 years and I know that um, they really appreciate the support so kind of cheesh thank you thank you going of cheesh for this opportunity to be here today Echo, thank you, Louise. Thank you for sharing those beautiful words. And we will have an opportunity at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, speakers um, to come back. And if you have questions for Louise, um, we'll be able to um, uh, get to those at the end during the Q and A. Our next speaker is Matthew Newman. Matt Newman is a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund, Alaska office. At NARF, Matt works in the areas of land use and natural resources with a focus on federal environmental permitting. He works on active campaigns throughout Alaska involving large coalitions of Alaska Native tribes, commercial and sports fishing interests, and conservation NGOs. His litigation practice focuses on natural resources and tribal land rights. He is a graduate of the University of Montana School of Law and is admitted to practice law in Montana and Alaska, as well as the Federal District of Alaska, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So with that, I'd like to open the Zoom space to Matt. All right. Thank you so much. Good morning to my fellow panelists, as well as uh, everyone who's been able to join us today. Uh, I would like to start uh, by thanking Luis for sharing her story and her words about the herring. Uh, and, and my presentation on the panel this morning is, is to kind of give a background, a legal background to how our fisheries are managed here in Alaska. And, and unfortunately, the tale that I have to tell is not a, a terribly happy one. Uh, from time immemorial up until about 200 years ago, the fisheries of what is now called Alaska were managed by the first peoples of the land and managed sustainably, successfully, in line with their cultural practices and their traditions. Uh, colonialism in Alaska began originally with the Russian Empire, uh, which came to Alaska in the 1700s and began a long history of exploitation 
of not only the people of Alaska, but the resources. And that began originally with the extraction and the taking of uh, fur-bearing animals, such as sea otters, but it also very quickly moved to the taking of fish stocks. And very quickly uh, in the 1800s into the beginnings of the 20th century, Alaska was utilized first by the Russians, then by the United States as a place to extract fish and doing so in, in methods and ways that were guaranteed to be unsustainable. Uh, in the early 20th century, the commercial interests here in Alaska used to utilize methods called fish traps. Essentially, they used to block off the mouths of entire rivers to take every single salmon that was attempting to return to its home stream. Not a single fish, male or female, was able to get past these elaborate fish traps. Uh, this system that was in place while Alaska was a territorial possession of the United States led to not only the crash of many of our salmon stocks and freshwater fish, but it also resulted in the inevitable impact on the people who depend on those resources and not just uh, depend on them for foods, for sustenance, but depend on them for their language, their religion, their cultures, those uh, sacred animals, those fish who are the foundation of so many indigenous cultures in Alaska were removed. Uh, and it was not until Alaska became a state in 1959 that some of the worst exploitive practices were ended, particularly the fish trap era was ended uh, upon statehood. However, uh, when Alaska did become a state and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game was established, that did not magically fix all the problems. While the fish traps were removed, we then began an era of state management of resources. And in doing so, uh, we replaced kind of the unmitigated commercial interests who were running fisheries at the time with the state system. And the state system, unfortunately, is dominated overwhelmingly by those same commercial interests. They just wear a different hat now. And the hat that they predominantly wear is the Board of Fisheries. In Alaska, we have uh, two boards, the Board of Game and the Board of Fish. These are uh, seven member boards that are responsible under the state constitution for managing wild game stocks and wild fish stocks throughout the state. Uh, they operate under a principle called maximum sustained yield. And this concept is a interesting one in that our fisheries and our game are managed in the state not for conservation purposes, not for uh, traditional or subsistence purposes, but rather on the principle of how much can we take without causing a collapse. And that uh, standard is, is not one based on any traditional knowledge, not even based on any Western scientific knowledge. It is focused entirely on take. How much can we take? And uh, unfortunately, throughout the history of the Board of Fish, uh, the membership of that board has been a teeter-totter that has changed at times between commercial fishing interests and sports fishing interests. What is noticeably absent from that system is traditional 
fishers, traditional hunters, the first people of Alaska who sustainably managed these stocks for thousands of years. And the system that currently exists is one that uh, Luis just described where you attend on the various cycles, the board cycles, different regions from year to year, but you attend during your regulatory cycle, a very official board meeting. You have three minutes to speak. It is governed by an elaborate rule of order uh, and individual citizens and particularly uh, tribal advocates who are there to simply carry on the activities and traditions that they have done for thousands of years have to try and navigate a system that is designed to operate against them. And the Sitka herring, I think is, is unfortunately one of the prime examples of how this system has failed Alaska's first people. Uh, herring, the herring fishery is uh, traditionally one that is done in a sustainable way by capturing row on hemlock branches. But the commercial interests that seek herring uh, have a majority on the board. And to their view of it, and has been for many years, is that to let those fish reach the tidewater areas, to let them reach the, the islands and to spawn is they view it not as a success in management or a success in allowing these fish to rejuvenate and to have people harvest in their traditional ways. They view it as lost money because if those fish make it to uh, their spawning areas, they have passed the commercial nets. And the entire fishery has been managed in with that mindset being the priority that fish who make it to spawn are lost dollars and cents. Uh, unfortunately, that's how the, the herring fishery has been managed. And recently there have been some successes. The Sitka tribe has been litigating a case in Alaska State Court for several years now, challenging the Board of Game, the Board of Fish and the Department of Fish and Game for how they prioritize and manage the fishery. Uh, they have had some successes. Uh, recently, a judge here in Alaska held that the Department of Fish and Game was not meeting its responsibilities to sustainably manage the herring stocks and has found that uh, the department has made no real attempt to provide the tribal people in the Sitka area a reasonable opportunity to subsistence fish. Uh, that case is ongoing, and it is very likely to be appealed to our state Supreme Court, but uh, the case is at least an example of some victories that have been achieved recently. It has a long way to go. And uh, all the while, the system of the Board of Fish is still in place and these struggles are still continuing. So our system here in Alaska is a troublesome one. It is a colonial model and is one that uh, has unfortunately caused a lot of heartache for local people who depend on this cultural resource that are the area. Go, thank you, Matt. We really appreciate you providing that um, uh, legal background and some of the important legal issues with respect to the um, herring fishery in Alaska. I'm sure that we'll have uh, we'll have more conversation um, during the Q and A uh, about these legal issues. I'd now like to um, introduce our next speaker, Louisa. Hosty Jones. Louisa is a counselor for the Haltzik Nation. She was elected in 2018 by the BC Chiefs and Assembly to the BC Assembly of First Nations Women's Representative 
and represents the province of the Assembly of First Nations Council of Women. Her council portfolios include marine emergency and marine response, lands and governance. Louisa has been in the herring sook fishery since she was 13 and running her own boat and crew for the past five years. So I'd now like to open up the Zoom space for Louisa. Thank you. I like to acknowledge all the panelists on today. Uh, my traditional name is Umkalux, which means ranking women standing up. I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Nanaimo people on Vancouver Island, Nanaimo, BC. Um, I come from the Helsinki Nation, located on the north coast of BC. Um, I do identify myself as a herring protector as well. Our people have looked after our coastlines since time immemorial. When the herring spawn in Helsinki territory, this means the tables are set. This is the beginning of, this, of our harvesting seasons. Our future generations depend upon the resources for food, social and ceremonial purposes, as well as employment, spiritual and cultural wellness. Our creation stories come from everything that our lands and waters hold. So if we lose something on our lands and waters, we lose a huge part of our identity and who we are as Helsa people. In 2015, DFO opened a commercial sacro fishery, a kill fishery. This opening was unjustified infringement upon the rights of our spawn on kelp fishery a right which was won in the Supreme Court of Canada. In 2015, we were forced to stand up and take direct action um, for our rights, for our rights for the herring and for the herring. Um, we did a total lockdown at DFO um, across the way from our reserve um, in Bella Bella, BC. Um, and it was really neat to see, um, you know, the, the DFO site was occupied by, by 99% women and children, you know, who, who were standing up for the rights of our people and for, you know, our resources. And I also just wanted to mention the importance of, of, of herring, um, in the food chain of all of our species, right now we're, you know, facing a huge decline in our salmon stocks, which we depend on as well. And, you know, the salmon depend on the herring, you know, so if we lose one thing in the food chain, you know, it's, it's we're gonna lose everything. You know, more importantly, the reason why we need to stand up for the herring. In 2013, I, um, I started um, in the commercial sacro fishery with my father. So I really got to witness the plentiful amounts of herring back then. And to be able to, you know, sadly witness the huge decline, you know, in the past 10 years of our herring, you know, running my own crew with, with my daughters, you know, doing the spawn on kelp fishery. And, you know, I, I continue to teach, you know, my daughters and the younger generation the importance of the herring and the importance of, of the food segments for, for our people because, you know, this is, this is huge for our ceremonies um, in our nation. Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, since in 2015, since we were forced to, to take direct action, um, we as a nation, we have a herring working group that sit at the table with DFO. Um, DFO doesn't make the decision anymore. We make a joint decision, you know, based on, you know, our knowledge um, of, of the herring, you know, within our territory, because 
you know, we know better than anybody else, you know, the stocks and how they're rebuilding. Um, and that's where we've had our successes, you know, um, since 2015, we've been able to, you know, work jointly with DFO to have the commercial sacro kill fishery, um, you know, closed. Um, um, we continue to put conservation first. Um, yeah, and we, we will just continue to, to put conservation first, you know, for our people, for, for our herring, for, you know, everything else in the food chains and, you know, our marine life, um, you know, so we're able to, you know, our future generations are able to have, you know, what we're able to have a little bit of right now. And we're, we're in a scary situation, you know, um, we need to, we need to continue to stand up for the herring. Um, yeah, before extinction happens. And um, I just like to acknowledge Louise, um, you know, with her presentation and her inspiration. Um, like I mentioned before, in 2015, it was women and children who occupied, you know, the DFI, DFO site. And from that, you know, it gave me inspiration to complete the circle of governance um, for, for the health of people. Um, five months ago, um, our Manuyaks, our, our Matriarchs Council um, came back together again and um, yeah, it was formed, they're formed now and they've signed on to the Helsic Declaration of Title and Rights, you know, which is huge because the women played a huge role, you know, and they continue to play a huge role within our, our nation. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, that, that you know, by taking direct action, you know, everything isn't 100%, but, you know, we have come a long way, um, you know, with DFO and, and taking care of our lands. Um, and I talked a little bit about um, um, the Supreme Court decision, and Saul will be talking a little bit more about that. Um, um, yeah, thank you, and I look forward to any questions at the end. To go. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa, for sharing those wonderful words. And yes, we'll definitely have time for to have more conversations around this and some of the issues you raised as well in our Q&A. Thank you. I will now like to introduce, I'd like to introduce Vina Brown. Vina is, Heiltzik, is a Heiltzik and New Channel scholar. Her Heiltzik name is Plakvasklau. Books. <laughs> I hope I'm getting that right, Vina. Which tr it, it loosely translates into copper um, uh, canoe woman. Vina recently served as the executive director of the Hunsut Wellness Center located in Halsik territory. She is presently working on a land-based wellness program with the Coast Salish Institute located on the Lummi Reservation with the Northwest Indian College. She is an adjunct excuse me, an adjunct faculty in the Native Studies Leadership Program at NWIC. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Native Studies and Leadership from Northwest Indian College and a Master's of Jurisprudence and in Indigenous Law from the University of Tulsa. And she is presently working on a PhD from the University of Alaska in Indigenous Studies with, an, with, a con, with concentrations in knowledge systems, research, education, and pedagogy. She is a wellness advocate, a certified yoga instructor, and a self-proclaimed food sovereigntist. She has participated in tribal canoe journeys her whole life and was raised within the Heiltzik territory where she witnessed the resurgence and renaissance of her own Heiltzik culture. So I'd now like to open up the Zoom to Vina. Klecko, klecko, Charlotte. Yeah, that was pretty good, actually. That was actually an awesome <laughs> attempt. It's Glockwes Gilwux. Um, and my name is, that's my ancestral name, my Heistok name that I received from my family. At um, It's an extension of my child name. And, I'm, and for, so for this panel, I'm like going into names and talking about stories and um, 
you know, cultural continuum and reaching back in time and not looking at time from a nonlinear perspective. That's kind of what I'm going to speak to today when it comes to the herring and um, Louisa and Louise, you know, they already, these two awesome women I see just community activists, grassroots women just do it as like Louise said, a labor of love. Like there's reasons why we do what we do. And so I'm really going to speak to that why the reason why we stand up for the herring, as Louisa said, the reason why we um, want to pass that relationship with the herring, our relatives, one nay, that's our Haitian word for um, herring, why we want to pass that on to our children and our children's children, um, you know, speaking to inherent rights, inherent rights, not acquired rights, like when we talk about the distinction between the two, um, our decision that we won in 1986, and I don't want to speak too much about it because my brother is going to go into that, Saul, the next speaker, um, but, you know, that's an acquired right, something that we had to fight for to have recognized in a court, in a colonial court. But to us, our relationship to, to um, sustain and enhance herring fishery stocks is it's inherent. It's not something that can be taken away from us, no matter what any court says that is, you know, especially if it's only 150 to 200 years old and we have, you know, 700 generations or 14,000, 15,000 years, according to archeology, span I'm just using Western definitions, but for us, it's time and memorial before time was time and here was here and before that. And so, you know, Louise, like, I really, that's why you do what you do, right? The fight for it is because it's not something that anyone can tell you you can't do. And so um, there's a few cases that I really wanted to observations. And one thing that too, really as an indigenous person who's in academia, and I really look at our knowledge systems, like our knowledge systems, the more I go into them and the more I speak with elders and talk to our knowledge keepers and look at our stories, they're super scientific right? They're not just stories. And I think that that's really um, even becoming more prevalent now that we're in this climate crisis that we're in. Like I'm in Bellingham, Washington right now, living on the Lummi reservation. And my son's school was canceled today because of this extreme weather. Um, you know, he's out in the living room, all the schools are closed. We just had the fires, the poor um, Lytton people up in the up on Highway 7 up there, they're now landlocked in again after being fleeing their territory. They just returned to their territory and now they're being landlocked in with landslides after they fl flew those wildfires in the summer. And so, you know, we're experiencing these vast and rapid change. And the one thing that I think held us steady as Indigenous people is our relational accountability and our reciprocity, the, rest, the reciprocity we had with the animals that we used as sustenance and food. And we, I always ask myself, you know, this kind of question through the lens of resource or relative, right? And, the, and we all, through science and through law, like colonial law and science, which is very young compared to our scientific measures and our ways of knowing and being, especially in our traditional territories, you know, it's always about a resource. How can we sustain? And how can we maintain? And our people were all about ensuring that everyone not only was sustained, including the, the non-human relatives, but everyone thrived and everyone had a right to live and be here and understanding that um, relationship in the web of human beings. And so when it comes to herring, you know, Louisa spoke about that 2015 standoff. There were some things, some metaphysical things that came from that. Right. And I really believe that that there is supernatural metaphysical um, things at play that sometimes science and Western notions cannot explain. One is that there was a song created right before that standoff between elders and knowledge keepers. Like I think it was in 2014 or 13, they created a one A song, a herring song. And so when that song was created, it was used the next year during the standoff and it became kind of like an anthem for our people right? And um, it's all about harvesting herring. So that song was created in a perfect time, if you want to say that, in a linear timeline, we created a beautiful new song. And I'm in my research right now, I'm looking at songs as not only methodology, but as like histor history markers in our timeline of how these songs remind us and these dances that we create. And Louise knows this, like she's that beautiful blanket behind her, you know, and I was kind of looking at all the videos before we came and, and, you know, our culture culture, our art, our songs, those were scientific measures and ways for us to remember our reciprocal relationship with the beings like herring. Herring will 
spawn six times in their lifetime, not like salmon. And so when you go in there and you just kill a herring, you're killing six generations of herring. You're not killing just a herring. You're killing six generations of thousands and thousands of fish. And our people knew that. We knew that we knew that we had to come up with measurement. We had to come up with methods of fishing that not only fed us, but fed the fragile ecosystem that we were a part of that the sea lions come, the wolves come down and eat the herring off the beach. The, the kakawin or the halkinuk, the orcas come in the humpback whales, everything comes. And one thing I really wanted to, to kind of root it into place, because I live down here in the South Puget Sound, like I live in Coast Salish territory and live among the Lummi people. And, you know, during COVID, if you know herring and some of you do, they're real fickle. They don't like noise when they come in and they want to spawn. And our people knew that when we're out on the herring ground, Saul, Louisa, Louise, you know this, like you got to be quiet, no loud motors, no speeding around. And it's because you're, it's respect, right? It's respect. It's about understanding that when the sacred thing is happening that takes care of everybody who comes in, everybody's quiet, lets them do their things because they don't like noise when they're doing that. And if you go down to the South Puget Sound and Duwamish territory, Suquamish, there, it's, there's so many boats, it's so noisy. COVID happens, right? COVID happens. And I'm talking from a metaphysical, supernatural perspective. All the boats are going in, nobody's out on the water, nobody's boating around. Things are really quiet. Who comes back? Who spawns on the shores in 2020? The herring. The herring come back and every all the scientists and um, you know, I read an article that the Suquamish were talking about. I went down to the beaches down here in Lummi and I could see the herring spawn on the beach. They hadn't seen herring up in Cherry Point here. That was a major herring fishery up here, just up, up here the way um, up at the point there. And they were trying to build a coal mine there or a coal train there and a port. And that would have destroyed the herring there, the little bit that was left. Right. And so I said to myself, I went and looked and I kind of sat on the beach and I was looking at the herring spawn. I was like, this is amazing because they asked the Suquamish elders and no one had living memory of herring spawning in the South Puget Sound like, like that in, in the last like 50, 60 years. And the scientists were all wondering what's going on. I'm like, it's because it's quiet. They have, they, they, they can go out there and do their thing. Like, and that didn't come from because I look, read an article about it. That because, came because I lived the experience of going out on the herring grounds as a child, as a grown up, and being told, be quiet. Don't, you know, like, we're not going to run our motor loud. We're going to putter around, like, taught about respect, right? And that, in the respect, the underlying values, the cultural values that come into place, those are things that are ingrained in us intergenerationally. Right. I'm sure Louisa and Saul and Louise will know these things that and it wasn't and it wasn't just because, you know, we're these romanticized Indians who have good values and know how to live with nature. It was very, very scientific. It was measured out. And it was also because we it was the law and it was because it was like logical. We had to make sure that the herring returned every year. Otherwise they go deep because they don't like to be, unless it's too, if it's too noisy near the shore, then they'll go, they'll go deep. So there's all these things when we talk about it, like from an indigenous perspective and specifically in this, like a Haisho perspective, you know, things that I know about herring that I just, because I grew up right now that I'm doing this academic research, like how do we intertwine those? And I think, so going back to the song that was created, so 2015 happens, we, we, and you know, like Louisa was right there on the front lines, all my brother was right there on the front lines, we were doing protests up here in Vancouver, shutting down streets to help support our relatives up at the, in the homelands. And then they shut down the fishery, we were successful and all the boats left and our people escorted all the, the, the boats out. They sang the herring song. And then the next year we had a really big spawn because that year we didn't go out. We said, no, we didn't even, we weren't even going to do a food fishery because it was, the stocks were too low. And DFO said, eh, it's fine. And their science was flawed. And we said, nope, we're not going to do it. So we fought and said, no, because we have to stand up for our Wawaktus, our relatives, the herring. We know your science is flawed. Our measurements, we know because we've done this for how many generations. So we're going to do this. So we did it. The next year, the herring returned and they, it was one of the biggest spawns we've seen in like a decade. And going back to the metaphysical, the songs created, the, st the standing up, remembering that ancient relationship that we have with the herring. And it's, it's documented in our stories. We have a story about Raven 
coming down and transplanting herring in, from one part of our territory to another part of our territory to help starving people. The people are starving. So Raven goes and transplants herring to Nulu, an area in our territory. So it, we know these stories. These are pre, like, these are pre, these are like supernatural, you know, so-called folklore mythological times, but our people use that. That's the why. Same thing happened up here in um, Cherry Point with Jay Julius was the, the, her, um, the elected uh, chief, I guess, at the time. And he was trying to figure out, we got to stop this, but I need to know more. it's more than treaty rights. So he goes to an elder, Sharon Kinley, and he says, I need to figure out how to get the people on board. She goes, your name comes from that area. When I, and she, she helped name him with his grandma. And she said this, this, and this. She goes, that's why you need to protect that area. It's not because you're the elected leader. It's not because we have a fishery that was um, acquired to us through the Bolt decision. The reason why we need you need to protect it is because that's your responsibility because that's where your name comes from. And it's a real big, deeper rooted difference on the why. Why do we stand up for herring? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a keystone species. It feeds everything. We need it to all stay alive, but there's got to be something deeper there. It's got to come from in here and it's got to be rooted. And that's why indigenous people are, should be, and are the front line, should be on the front lines leading these initiatives, especially when it comes to our knowledge systems and our, in, um, our indigenous um, scientific measures, for example, and it's proven we have a no kill fishery that is it's mainstream we sell it to Japan it's a spawn on kelp we don't kill fish for it. It's um, sustainable and it's based on ancient technology right so the work's already been done it's already there, and if only we could just get over the systemic racism and the white supremacy thinking that indigenous people don't know what to do and how to manage our fisheries and get past that and move more into collaborating like the like the joint management that we had to fight for they weren't going to give it to us they weren't going to give it to us we had to fight our people had to put our bodies our physical bodies in the way to say we hear us we want to do this and we have the right to do this so the next year the herring show up and it was the biggest spawn and my father frank brown um ahimas from our community said you know i think they did that to thank us they came they came back because they knew we stood up for them they felt it right and that's how you we move in our territory between the animals like louisa really spoke to that about taking care of the land, taking care of the water. And we, you know, we think animals are dumb. We don't honor that they have this intelligence and they do. And we have this ancient relationship. We see them as people like, look at Louise's blanket behind there, right? Like that's a beautiful, beautiful symbol, symbiotic representation of the, the respect that her people have for herring. And our art reflects that, our stories reflect that, to seeing that recipro reciprocity. And it's, it always is returned to us. If we can act in reciprocity with the animals that and the other living beings that we share this world with and do it in a way that can combine, you know, the, the, the greatness of Western science that, you know, at times is really young, but makes good ways, but also looking at ways of knowing that have already been proven and work. And we're a great example of that, that our methods and our ways of managing our territories and our, and one fishery, because we have a lot of other fisheries in our territory, it works and it actually works really well for everybody. And so I'll just leave that there. Like, I really just wanted to speak to like, you know, how the depth and the why of why we fight for the herring and why we, you know, the stories of this ancient relationship and the songs and the markers and, you know, and then using that as scientific no measurements and knowledge and then turning that over and like, well, we, you, we, it's worked in the, the courts too, right? Because our stories were proven. We had to fight again in 1996. And I'll leave that there and Saul can speak to that more. But I just want to say, you know, Wallace Gayasika to everybody for being here and to the, my other panelists and to Charlotte and um, UW and all the other sponsors that were mentioned earlier for putting this on because this is such an important issue and it impacts us more than we know. All of us, right? Because we're all connected and the ocean is like the herring you know, if, if there's herring, you have a healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Let go. Thank you, Vina. Really appreciate you sharing your 
um, personal experiences, your cultural knowledge, and and as well as the importance of our story or our stories and our song traditions in keeping our histories alive. Clicko, thank you. So I will introduce our last speaker, Saul, and hopefully I'm going to get your name right, Saul. Hachgilfa, Saul Brown is from the New Channels and Haltzik Nations and is in his final year of completing a law degree at the University of Victoria. His academic writing has focused on indigenous marine stewardship and governance. His, excuse me, he is the recipient of the Law Foundation of BC Public Interest Law Award, First Nations Public Service Scholarship, First Peoples Law Indigenous, First Peoples Law Indigenous Law Student Scholarship, and the Jamie Castles Undergraduate Research Award from the university's Department of Political Science. Saul is the former, um, the former negotiator for the Haltzik reconciliation process and has worked as a governance advisor for, for First Nations across the province. He is the founder of Yilpas Consultancy, which serves indigenous communities by assisting them exercising their inherent jurisdiction and rights over their territories, reconstituting indigenous govern governments and enhancing human well-being. So I'd like to open the Zoom to Saul. Guy Asika, Charlotte. So AQ Suiyut, good morning, or you might be at uh, noon now. Uh, so uh, my name is Ajishpa. And uh, thank you to all the panelists who spoke before me. I think you guys really framed out the issue well. And then Vina and Louisa from Hilfja really brought into focus the why we do what we do. And before I get into the how, how do we help each other? How do we help each other across, as Lu Louise said, this imaginary border? When we move forward as Indigenous people, it's grounded in our experience. You know, Matt spoke to some of the colonization, the process of systemic colonization, and Vina talked about white privilege within science and in decision-making bodies. And we move forward as Indigenous people grounded in an understanding that there is no altruism for us, in that there's going to be no altruistic handing over of jurisdiction over the marine areas because that's about economy. We heard about the doctrine of uh, majority yield or this, this idea that we take as much as we can without collapse. And so there's this, the colonial capitalistic values that underpin fisheries in, in, in this, that's a reality that we operate in as indigenous peoples. So when we go forward, we know that we got to stand up for what's rightfully ours. We're not asking for anything that isn't ours. We always had management of the Harry since time immemorial, since supernatural beings paddled their canoes on our water as Vinus spoke about Harry moving, uh, Raven moving Harry from one area to another. And this fight to take back what's rightfully ours kind of manifests itself in three separate ways that I'm gonna talk about in the context of Harry. And, when you talk about herring, it's kind of hard because herring is such a broad, complex issue that's embedded in a constellation of relationships. So the herring we heard, of, you know, um, interrelated to salmon, into whales, into all the different sorts of uh, food webs that we come from that we're part of, that human beings are integral part of. And so, but I'm going to talk about these three ways. And the first one is direct action. So, and this, this comes right out of uh, colonization itself. For a time, we couldn't hire lawyers. Canada, through the Indian Act, outlaw, outlawed the hiring of lawyers. I couldn't even become a member of the bar as an Indigenous person. I'm sitting in a home right now with my parents um, in unceded Lekwungen territory, and I'd be gathering the three Indians. If we were out in public, the potlatch ban that was policy and law in Canada would outlaw that. So let that resonate for a bit. So that's where direct action comes from because another part is litigation or going to the courts. So the first, the first uh, thing we, the first arm we do is there's direct action, litigation, negotiation to protecting what we do. So the first one, direct action. Louisa talked about 2015 when the Fisheries Act and the minister delegated with managing the Fisheries Act 
condoned a fishery, but that fishery that in 2015 that was condoned was after a six year moratorium. There was no herring in our territory for six years. And I remember getting a call. I have my undergraduate degree from University of Victoria and as in my last year studies, I was 23 year old and I got a call from my dad. And he, just like us, have been on the forefront of protecting herring. And we talked about why it's so important. He said, son, they're gonna open it again. They're gonna collapse the stocks. And my dad, if any of you know him, he's a hereditary chief from uh, Heltzik territory. He has a lot of fire and he's a fighter for what he knows is right, for what he knows is just, and he was tired. So what I did is I said, I'm not gonna let this Western education pacify me or strip me of my right to stand for the herring. So I went and bought a shotgun and headed north, headed home, headed to the homelands. And what we did is when we got there, we were sitting around in a church, which is kind of ironic if you think about it because the church hasn't always been our allies in Canada. So we're sitting around in the United Church in Bella Bella. And we're talking about, well, what if we, um, when the, the gill netters and hairy uh, seine boats uh, pull up their nets, we get in a canoe and we get flipped over in the canoe. Oh, well, what if we get tangled in the net and we drown? We don't want to put anyone's life at risk, but we'll put people's liberty at risk. And we talked about Martin Luther King and that the whole civil rights movement, that nonviolent aspect of, oh, what if we go cut their lines? Well, we could get charged for cutting lines for destruction of property. So we sat around and we strategized about how to, to stand up and we said, we're going to go serve that DFO building an eviction notice. This is unceded Hillstock territory and they never asked for permission to do so. So we went over there and Louisa said in 2015 it was mostly women and children. And I was, uh, I was 23 and I was skippering a canoe that we paddled over with all youth. And we put this eviction notice up on the DFO and then we we're about to leave and go back to our village. And in my younger days, I, I got mad. I said, I'm not gonna leave. I'm not gonna leave, this is BS, we're gonna leave here. And so I yelled scorn and uh, shame at these DFO officers who are armed, who carry sidearms. And so um, the women and children and some allies, we, we started to occupy the building, but we quickly realized, so the way it works in Canada, DFO stands for Department of Fisheries and Oceans, but there's also Coast Guard. So, um, we didn't want to impede any Coast Guard because the Coast Guard provides an essential service in terms of where, you know, maritime people. And if there's anyone who gets in an accident or there's anything that happens, we want the Coast Guard to be able to respond. So we started to occupy this building, but we wanted to ensure that the Coast Guard could uh, carry out their discharge responsibilities of responding to any accidents in their territory. So then we started to, to take over the DFO building proper itself. And uh, when we were taking over this building, two of our leaders got into the actual office, stayed day and night while the whole community surrounded the building. And, and this is where I think this comes in is we, we reached out. So Vina was taking over a building in Vancouver, in Bella Coola, another uh, indigenous territory, another building where there was protests down there. There was protests down in Victoria. My sister got to us I, and I talked on the phone. 99% of the herring licenses belong to someone who's known as Jimmy, Jimmy Patterson who's a billionaire in BC, who also owns grocery stores. We said, if you're gonna take from our food source, we're gonna go block yours. So we did, we blocked the grocery store in Victoria saying colonial capitalism, they're interrelated. That's the undervalue, that's the undervalue, that's the, that's a, the, the values that are underlying your system. So we're gonna go and, you know, this man owns those licenses, even though it's DFO condoning it, it's for the value system of trying to take and take and take as a resource. So we started to reach out to our relatives and they responded in force. The Coast Salish, the Haida, you know, the BC Klingit up in Teslin, Alaska, I mean, Teslin, BC, just below the, the Yukon border, all these places where we reached out to started to respond because they know what we've been through. And that made that that much stronger because no one really knows who we are up in the uh, central coast of BC. There's no road there. We're not a big nation. And so what we really had to do, and here's another thing that another how is, is we had to prime the media pump. We had to prime the media pump. We had to share why we do what we do, but also show that how integral you know, herring are for an ecosystem. So we had to really bring light to the injustice 
We have to really bring light to the underlying values of colonial capitalism. And so that's the big thing about uh, direct action. You know, we put our, our liberties on the line, our civil liberties, our freedom to be arrested. Now think about that. Would you put your civil liberties on the line for your relative, for your daughter, for your grandmother, maybe your cousin? Would you be arrested for them? Spend the night in jail, have a criminal record, and that's what we're giving up. And we're not doing it for us because a healthy hair in population equals a healthy ecosystem, which equals a healthy human population, not just for the Hilfta, not just for the Klingit, you know, not just for the new channel, but for the greater benefit of society. And uh, when we do direct action, we call it to allies, people like Matt who dedicate their time, energy, careers to trying to bring some equitable justice. And I think that's a really big part of that is seeking out allies who, who share those same values. And then the next prong, so there's direct action, litigation, negotiation. The next prong is uh, litigation. And as I said, you know, indigenous people, we've had a pretty tumultuous relationship with uh, colonial law or Canadian law since it uh, superimposed itself onto our territory. And um, so this started in uh, it was Harry and it started with Gladstone. And there's two brothers who in 1988, before I was born, tried to sell and commercially trade um, by selling a herring rope. And they were criminalized for doing so. Their assault rifles pulled on them and they were criminalized and they lost at the lower courts and the way the court system works in Canada, it's an appellant system. So you go to the local courts and then regional courts and then national courts. And in Canada, we have a thing, uh, called Section 35.1, and it's through this constitution. And Section 35.1 basically affirms that we have uh, constitutionally protected rights. Uh, they call it Aboriginal rights. Uh, we call it just being Indian, you know? Like we're just, hey, it's just who we are and what we do. Um, but to them, they have all these fancy tests that are built up in jurisprudence or case law through the Sparrow and Van Der Peet test to decide if we actually had um, a right to do this. And so these, these two brothers, Bill and Don Gladstone of the Hilfta, went and said, we're not going to let the Fisheries Act, which is a federal statute, a federal statute that managed herring, dictate whether we could do what we've always done since time memorial. So they were arrested and, you know, had some violence, state violence perpetuated against them. And, and they had the fortitude and the wherewithal to withstand years of litigation because in 1996, the Supreme Court vindicated them and said that no, all they were doing is doing what their forefathers had done. All they're doing is doing what their foremothers have done. And it's the first and only commercial Aboriginal right that's been proven as a section 35 right. And so I'm not gonna spend too much time on, you know, this isn't a constitutional law class or anything. But it is really interesting because that's, as Vina said, one species. And we had so, we had relationship with so much more. And, and how I said is relationship, uh, the herring is part of a, you know, an interrelated web of, of um, constellations that we don't even see as human beings um, out in the ocean. And so uh, we have this right to herring, but really it's, uh, it's, it's, it should, and it's a right to subsist. And I, I don't like that because we should have a right to manage. We should have a right to manage herring, a management right, a jurisdictional right, not just a right to commercially benefit, not just a right to, um, you know, ha have some for sustenance to eat, but a right to manage and be in relationship with them as our ancestors had. And then the third prong of the how is negotiation. So, and I think these aren't, you know, um, silos. They work together, these three prongs. And so after in 2015, we went and shut down multiple DFO buildings. And as Vinus said, there was no fishery, but we went into negotiation right away because you know what happens? The herring come every year if we're lucky. And it's not sustainable to put your civil liberties and your freedom on the line every 
preparing season. Because as Luis said, it's our favorite time of year. Oh, it's, it's jubilant. It's joyful. We all come together after cold, dark, hard winters. And we're all, you know, harvesting and hanging out and getting out on the water, which is our, you know, a lot of our happy places. And so the last thing we wanted to be doing is taking on armed department fishery and oceans and armed police departments. And that's the last thing we should have to be doing. But we do it. But we do it because our laws dictate we must. And so we went after 2015 and negotiated what's called the Joint Management Plan. I'm going to really briefly go over how this works. So first thing that they does, if we want to have a decision, it goes to the science table. Now, science has been weaponized and used as a rationale against Indigenous fisheries since, you know, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans came into a, a being. And to Louise, your point about that, that uh, you know, that council, that seven person council that both of you and Matt spoke about, you know, the fisheries board, they, you know, um, they, you, they say, oh, you only have stories. We have science. So what we started doing is we hired our own scientists to analyze the data. So we have our own scientists that we went and hired to analyze the herring data because that should be public resource. And if not, you know, you should be a get freedom of information request to access that. So then we could analyze that. So this first thing is science table. Then we go up to the expert table where you have people who might be in, uh, you know, conservation management, have that sort of thing. And then we have our elders and our experts or, or local fishermen, people like Louisa and others. And then it goes to the principal decision maker which is the, you know, the person discharged from uh, the cabinet, which is the fisheries minister who heads the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And then we have our HEMOS, our hereditary leaders and elective leaders. And if there's a no at any one of those, those points, it doesn't go through because it needs to be, it's an elevated, a tier system it has to be yes for any fishery to be open. So that's called, that's, that's true joint management right there. And, and so that's written up expressly in an agreement. And uh, that is only possible, though, because it's at the political will. It's not legislated. It's not a constitutional right. That's a negotiated agreement that's written explicitly and expressly. But then what the threat is, is we're going to go to war on the water. You don't respect our, our jurisdiction and our uh, decision-making rights, then we're going to go to war on the water or we're going to go litigate. And so why I say this is because there's kind of, you know, these three prongs need to work together and they're not mutually exclusive. And I think that's what we're talking about here is this transboundary issue of coming together and working together because we're stronger together. When we call out for our relatives, they responded. Now, if our relatives call out to us, we need to respond because if it happens to one of us, it can happen to all of us. And that's what true equity is. And as Indigenous people, I think we really know that because we felt the harms of when there's not true equity. And I just want to say one thing, too, about stories, because that broke my heart, you know, when we, we talk about um, all you have is stories, because as Vina said, they contain law. They contain scientific method, politics, sociology, medical content. So our, our new humor, our stories, our systems of knowledge are so rich and so deep that you're actually doing yourself a disservice and knowledge as a whole if all you see is stories because science is a story. Science was not only weaponized against fisheries, science was weaponized against human beings. In the Spanish courts of the 16th century, they said they tried to use a scientific method to determine if indigenous peoples had souls or not because if they did, then they could be saved and Christianized. But if they didn't, they could be killed and enslaved. Now think about that the intersection between science and the courts and the long history and the rotten foundations that that's built on. And I guess here's my, uh, here's my last kind of uh, how, or my last suggestion after hearing from Matt and Louise is to push back on the, the state management and this, this fisheries board by producing a Klingit report based on Klingit law. And um, it should be, substantiated by that Klingits always had law. The superimposition of uh, state law and American law does not extinguish or erase Klingit law. Therefore, Klingit law is actually part of the fabric of state law because it's still of these lands, of Alaskan lands. So you create a, a herring report uh, to adjudicate or to talk about the shortcomings 
and judge the shortcomings of the current management system, but do it on Tlingit law because we don't stand up for the herring just because that they're our relatives or because there's this metaphysical connection or the reciprocity. We do it because a strict law bids us to our guelas. And so when the Fisheries Act opens uh, fishery in contravention of our law, it's not the Indians protesting, it's a clash of legal systems well thought out logical legal systems that are literally clashing and then after you have this you propose a joint management in part of this report and then you actually bring this to them and present it in written content because if you only have three minutes and i think that's my time there so i think i'll leave it at that is you write a report based on Tlingit law or another first nations law you and then you you bring a propose a joint management plan based on on that on multi jurisdictional area of, of this uh, of herring and uh, and then you you utilize those three prongs wherever you need to and uh, call on us. Call on us because we'll be happy to respond because others have responded to us when we needed it and that's reciprocity Wallace Guyasica, thank you. Great, Plako, Plako, thank you so. Thank you for sharing the high, the Halsic legal history um, and your legal struggles in, in uh, reclaiming and regaining control over your fishery. We really appreciate it and providing that, that legal history. I want to raise my hands and say Plako to all of our speakers today for sharing this really important and valuable knowledge with all of us. Ushak Shetleetsu, um, we really, really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A. We'll now move into the Q&A. And if you have any questions, you can either upload them into the chat, write them into the chat, and we will get to those questions. Or you can also use the raise hand function and we'll, um, we'll um, watch for the raised hands as well. But if any of you have a question, we can now open up the uh, Zoom space for your questions. And I don't know, Ben, if any questions were already uploaded into the space. Nothing um, came out yet, no. Oh, quiet bunch of people. <laughs> Come on, I have a hundred questions. Good comments, though. I want to hear your <laughs> questions, Charlotte. <laughs> Who wants to start? Who wants to raise their hand first? Or if you just want to provide a comment to our, our speakers as well. I did have a clarifying question. I wanted to learn a little bit more of the history of the sacro fishery in Heltzuk territory. And so it sounds like there was a moratorium for six years before the 2015 opening. Was there a sacro fishery before that? Yeah, there was. So um, <clears throat> there was sacro, and then we were still trying to practice our, as Vina said, our non kill fishery of uh, herring roe on kelp. And as Vina said, a herring can spawn up to six to 10 times in their lifetime. And so, and that Supreme Court decision basically said that we had a, a right to fish and commercially benefit from it, which is, that says, says that in Gladstone. And they set out a doctrine of priority, which is conservation, uh, subsistence, uh, then commercial Aboriginal right, and then commercial right. But then the way it actually works is when the sacro guys come in, that's before the herring spawn, mm -hmm. right? And so they're still actually um, coming and taking Harry now and then therefore leaving nothing and so um, we we had to really fight those sacro guys and then what and then in, there's a six-year moratorium where there no one fish we didn't fish I had nieces and nephews that never had hairy eggs mm. and, and and so during those six years because we let it rebuild so even though you know we economically benefit off of it the social, cultural, spiritual being and the nourishment that Harry provide to us during the six years, we didn't fish. And then when they try to open up the sacro fishery again, that's when we shut it down and we were so and, and I think that's part of it, too, is, you know, even though we had a we have a commercial average, right, that's, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada upholding the supreme law of the land and we still have to go direct action, which is is pretty uh, mind boggling if you think about that and the way paramountcy of law should work. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? I see a hand raised. Ah, Suksha, Adam, you have a question? 
Hi, my name is uh, Adam Worley. Uh, I'm tuning in from Charlotte's hometown and uh, on Vancouver Island. Uh, I had, uh, I'll ask two questions if I may. So the first, um, I'd like to hear more detail about what uh, Vina was talking about, uh, about the rebound of the herring fishery after the closure. What year was that? And what have you observed in the years since then? Um, that was the year after, so 2016. Um, and so, I mean, we've had, we've had, like we've, we've done our commercial fish ever since, and we've done, um, we've, and every year since and ceremonial. So we've been able to have, um, we've been able to have the fishery since then and both commercial and ceremonial because that's what we do when we're out there. We're fishing for both. We're getting our quota for um, the, to sell on the commercial, um, into the, on the commercial market. And then we're also, you know, uh, filling our freezers and getting some for trade because we still really trade with our relatives. So yeah, um, it was the year after and it's been okay since. I think one thing too that um, I'm really nervous about is just to add on that is like, yeah, it's great right now, but I'm really worried about climate change um, in, in the sense of like the oceans warming, right? The acidification, mm -hmm. herring are so fickle. And I think, I think that's the next kind of big fight. Like we, you know, me, Saul and Louise all talked about the fight. And what do you do when you can't see your enemy to that? You know, we know how we've been dealing with colonialism since all of us have been dealing with colonialism since you know, 150 years, 200 years before, even 150 years before Canada was the fur trade, right? And that was when we first seen that aggressive predatory, you know, just go in there and just harvest everything till it collapses. And now what do you do when it's flooding and, and the, the water's warming up? And, you know, so that's kind of like what's on the, I think on the next level or the next fight of our generation and my son's is like, how are we going to, and I know people are acting and moving, but it's scary, right? Like we talking about it, like this fighting just for an access to have a feed. What do we do when the herring can't be in the water anymore because the ocean's too warm and the acidification changes, right? Then what happens to everything? The salmon, we've seen it in the South Puget Sound with the orcas not having enough spring salmon to eat. Well, they don't, or kings as the US call them, but well, it's because there's no herring for the salmon to eat. And so it's all connected, right? Then the orcas are dying. And, and so, yeah, it's just really, it's just really interesting. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Vina. Thanks, Vina. Um, ben, I think has that question. Let's see. Yeah, to Matt, do you have thoughts about the similarities of Canadian law to our legal context in Alaska? paramountcy of subsistence, indigenous legal approaches in state courts, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it is a very difficult one, especially if you're here in Alaska. I mean, there are uh, a lot of differences while both Canada and the United States are, are both colonial nations. Uh, there are a great deal of differences between our two legal systems and the body of federal Indian law that exists in the United States is even in many ways different here in Alaska. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most uh, prominent differences is that while many of the tribal nations uh, inhabiting the continental United States uh, entered into treaties with the federal government in the 1800s and Many of those treaties, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, guaranteed to the tribes the right to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed places. Uh, here in Alaska, uh, there was no treaty making. Uh, Russians were here only to exploit, not to, to uh, engage in government to government relations with Alaska tribes. Uh, when the United States came onto the scene, they likewise attempted to make no treaties. So the Alaska tribes, the 229 tribes here in Alaska, 
do not have treaty rights guaranteeing their hunting and fishing in their usual and accustomed places. And to make matters more complicated, in 1971, in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, the federal government purported to terminate any Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights uh, within the state of Alaska. Um, so our legal system here is, is hindered uh, for, from establishing those kind of paramount rights. We do have some federal laws and even some state laws that guarantee a priority for subsistence users to have priority in the harvest of stocks. Uh, however, those words on paper uh, have taken a lot of blood, sweat, and tears of tribal leaders, tribal activists, attorneys, uh, to guarantee that that priority is actually uh, respected and honored to allow traditional hunters and fishers access to those uh, resources that they depend upon. Um, and unfortunately, while uh, federal law certainly has at least, I won't say a great record, but a better record than the state when it comes to uh, providing a priority to native people in hunting and fishing. When we're talking about a stock like herring, uh, they fall under the state system. Our uh, regulatory system here in Alaska depends entirely on where you are on a GPS. Uh, if you were fishing, for example, three miles off the coast, you'd be subject to federal regulations and federal priorities. If you're fishing in the tidal areas along the coastline, you're subject to state law. Uh, and the herring example in Sitka, I think is, is kind of one of the sad examples of how the state system has failed. Um, it's not entirely a lost cause and, and the Sitka tribes litigation that they are still uh, taking on in the state courts is, is a wonderful demonstration that uh, the tribes are able to achieve some victories in the management of fish stocks within state waters. But uh, because of the absence of treaties, because of that termination of Aboriginal rights to hunt and fish within the state of Alaska, it's an uphill battle. And uh, it has been a, a very difficult one for tribes, not only in the Southeast, but across the, the large landmass that is now the state of Alaska. Great, thank you, Matt. Nadine had a question. Nadine, let's see. Yes, Nadine. Hi there. Um, I wanted, so it's Nadine. I'm um, with the Canadian Studies Center at the University of Washington. And actually want to first just by thanking Marion and Ben for your vision and putting this together. It's just a fabulous opportunity for all of us to see and hear one another and all the speakers just tremendously um, inspiring and motivating. And my question is to any of the speakers and it, it's a bit of a broad question but you know this is sponsored primarily by a university. I'm with the university. University of Washington is a large institution. Um, uh, higher ed is, you know, predominantly really a, a, a liberal community, but I think in its structure and its function, it's very, very conservative. And so my question to all of you is working within this system, um, what would you like to see at the university? How can the university in its present form, because we're not going to change it overnight, how can the university in its present form serve more as an ally, support these efforts, um, use the structure that we're in to be able to affect change and impact um, with our students. And, you know, very broad question, but just wonder if, if you have any thoughts about this, given again, you know, the parameters we're working within. I'll go real quick, just 
two quick points. One, you're going to be, I don't know what your, you know, resource management problem programs are like, but you're going to be producing the next resource managers. So those same people who are, um, you know, have the responsibility of managing herring or salmon or whatever else within, uh, you know, Alaska or down in Washington, or maybe they go, you know, even into BC, but this whole coast. So one, making space for indigenous knowledge to take hold and take root on its own terms, not assimilate it in to the academic knowledge. And I think there's really amazing academics I'd like to hear from the panel, like especially Vina, my Manuyux, or even Charlotte. So one is, as you create these next decision makers and nurture and germinate the next ideas for the next generation coming up to hold these positions is make space for indigenous people and indigenous knowledge to take hold and flourish on its own right. Not talking about the Canadian or the American story of what all the, the horrific and insidious things that happened to us, but what about all that beauty and that hope and that, that regeneration of indigenous knowledge that happens intergenerationally between um, and in families and communities? And then the sex, second thing is just, um, I, so that's the first, you know, that's the first one is like actually developing these next wave of decision makers and making sure there's indigenous knowledge incorporated. And the second thing would be is just to actually, like, as you say, um, like you talk about what is knowledge, you know, what is science? And so like we talk about that and, and it has been exclusionary and weaponized against indigenous peoples. So thinking and, and reconceptualizing and that and, and seeing value in it, seeing value and brilliance in indigenous science and indigenous knowledge and indigenous law, I think will be um, beneficial, not only to being an ally, but for all of us. Because as Vina said, you know, we're on the abyss of a climate catastrophe flooding, wildfire season, all these things. And indigenous people have been here in this place for at least 14,000 years. Now imagine the knowledge repository that we have that we could actually use because climate's been changing. It's just the exasperation through the Anthropocene, through the human caused aspects of. So, but imagine what we've, the knowledge we've accrued in terms of um, you know, climate change. So I think those are the two main things that I, I would say, but I'm really interested to hear from the, from the academics on the panel. Lina, would you like to share? Yeah, I could share a little to this. And I just wanted to go back to, um, was it Hukshu comment too? I, I got a message. Um, I just wanted to, last year, cause we're talking about climate change. Um, last year we didn't get quota. I just got that. And I didn't go home to fish cause it was COVID. Um, and uh, there wasn't quota. And then the year before it was low. So the stocks are lowering and we are and Louisa and all both informed me of that um I, I realized I should have sent that question that way because I'm not I don't live at home but they both um do and they go back and forth and I go home for the fishery when there's no COVID right so I just wanted to kind of update on that um and so for this I think you know working in like I work for Northwest worked for Northwest Indian College served as the department chair for the Native Studies leadership for many years and this is something we talk about all the time that's this is why we why tribal colleges exist right like this is why tribal colleges exist because I really like how Saul put it and you know he just sent me an article last night our whole family that Lee Miracle wrote about um talking about kind of this empowerment right this empowerment theory of like how and that's what it's all about and especially in for young people who are finding their way on what they want to do in the world how do we empower non um and young people indigenous or non-indigenous to support and uplift indigenous initiatives that are general are good for everybody right like i'm not just saying this is like you know, I think that's the narrative too we have to get around is like this isn't just and I feel like I'm speaking to the you know the choir here or you know preaching to the choir because I know this people came here because they have an interest in this but like you know really being intentional about that's why it, the, um, the tribal college I used to work for Northwest Indian College we had our own envir environmental science bachelor's degree and literally it was because the tribe said the tribe said and so that's it listen to what the tribes want and need because they know what they need in their community we want to have our own people trained in a program when they go re work in our resource develop, uh, department, our um, resource management departments, because tribes have big resource management departments, especially in the US, 
right? They have a lot of more infrastructure for it. We want our own people trained in using Western, be able to use Western methodology, but also our own methodology. And they need to be how be strong in both and how to work them together and interweave them together. And so we have one of the strongest at the Northwest Indian College, one of the strongest native environmental science programs where our students come out and they can take samples. They can go to the beach. They know how to do all the scientific measurement stuff, but they also know how to recognize and implement and um, work in the na environmental, the native science, the native knowledge systems without as a, as a second thought. And, I, and that's the same thing at native native studies like we're not just doing things where we're using you know using um, western frameworks and sprinkling indian stuff on it after to make it look indigenous it has to be really thorough it has to be rooted in indigenous worldviews first and that needs to be the framework the indigenous worldview and the indigenous knowledge systems and then work in the scientific westernized stuff so it's flipping it around right and i think that that's something that indigenous people are really good at doing is like to say you know we and, and sometimes even me as an indigenous person i get caught up in these westernized systems and i realize like no like it's not it's not that way and like kind of turning around like it's like what louise and them are going through up there in alaska like they this shouldn't even like what Saul said this shouldn't even be an afterthought like they're not we're not asking for nothing that isn't ours they're not asking for nothing that isn't theirs you know they're not asking you know and it should be like literally like it enrages me but it's like you know alaska they should have this, they should be bringing in, they should be so lucky to have those elders come and speak to them for three minutes. Like the audacity that these people think that, you know, that, and that just goes to show where the, the mind is of those, the leaders in Alaska, where the mental, where the, the healing that needs to happen in the mind and the shift of the paradigm that needs to happen to still think that these people who have thousands of years of relationship with Harry don't know what they're doing or aren't they're ringing the alarm they're saying what's going on with our herring you know we need to do this and Alaska's just saying yeah you get three minutes you know the fishery department and so in on a collegiate level back to your question Nadine like it needs to be the framework so if you want to be like a you know the university then yeah go in there create programs that are, are is using indigenous frameworks created by indigenous people rooted in place-based knowledge systems, mm -hmm. and then add in the scientific stuff to complement or enhance that sustainable enhanceability, whatever it is topic that you're talking about management resource. And that's where it needs to start, right? And I mean, and, and like funding's always great, scholarships for indigenous people, like Saul said, you know, um, and then that will enhance people. If like a non-Indigenous person goes into a program like that and then goes out in the world, right? It's, so it's just really, there's a lot of work to be done in this area, but I always say like, flip it around. It's not just like, we don't want to just tokenize native people or just say, yeah, we do a little bit of this. It's like, no, you need to tear it down and rebuild it a little and reframe it in a really meaningful way. And there's, there are programs that are doing that. Tribal colleges are doing amazing work with that. So. Exactly. Great, thank you. And I, I don't really have a lot to add. I, I would like to just echo what uh, Vina has said. And um, Nadine, I think at the University of Washington, we are seeing movement to indigenize our campus, especially with the recent appointment of uh, Suquamish member and uh, tribal chair, Leonard Forsman to our board of regents. So we're seeing significant changes. And, and I completely agree with Vina that it can't be just tokenism, you know, that we invite um, uh, professors or bring in more students, that it's just some kind of tokenism. It has to be real. Our ontologies, our methodologies need to be centered within our academic institutions, within our, within our programs. And, um, uh, and I, I really think that we are seeing some changes at our university on our campus, um, but there's still a long ways to go before we can really say that our university has been indigenized. One thing that I've always um, stressed at the university, which I really, really am pushing for and hope that you know, when I leave, if it hasn't happened, that somebody else will take on this, um, this um, um, cause is to have every student at the University of Washington take a Northwest Studies Indigenous course, Indigenous History course, that every student, that we're not just part of a diversity credit, which is how, the, how our 
support our Native American or American Indian Studies courses are looked at right now, that they fit a diversity credit. I really think that we really need to have every student on campus take a Northwest Studies um, or Northwest uh, Coast Indigenous Studies course. So they, they know this history, that they know the history, the Indigenous history, our history of this land and space that, um, that they occupy. I think that's very important. I, um, we have uh, some more questions. I, sorry, Louisa here. I would just like to add to, um, to Vina and Saul's um, points. Um, it, it's really important that um, place-based knowledge, you know, needs to come into play, you know, within our nation, um, a non Celtic member that comes into our community um, to work with our people or we come out of our community and work with non Celtic people, we um, always give a cultural orientation um, to the people that we're working with to give them a better understanding of who we are as Celtic people and where we come from and, you know, the issues that we face directly. So I think that you know, place-based knowledge is super important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Louisa. Just quickly, I, I've um, been up to the University of Alaska Fairbanks several times and I've been so impressed with the way that, you know, they have um, tribal governance symposiums and they always involve elders and they always, the way that, that the symposiums are designed to involve um, just a, a different feeling from the classroom so that the elders who are invited into the classroom are allowed to speak again uh, from traditional knowledge. They've also done a really good job as far as, um, you know, like research technicians, they've been working on um, culture as prevention and training um, research technicians out in the villages instead of, you know, maybe having somebody from a university down south going into a village with 100 people, somebody who's not familiar with the culture, they take the time to train people to, to do the research and then hopefully tie them in um, to a university. So people are thinking, you know, I might be able to do that. They've been doing some excellent work. Great, thank you. Thank you, Louise. I am, I'm going to go to the chat. I know some people have their hands up, but Melissa has had her question in the chat for a while and I want to just read out her question. Um, let's see, have there been any particular impacts from commercial herring management and federal laws that have disproportionately impacted indigenous women when it comes to their unique relationships and practices with heron, herring? And this comes from Melissa Poe. I think Louisa should give a crack at that one too, or Louise, one of those two. Right, so um, my, a lot of my background is um, domestic violence. And one of the things that I know is basically, I think we're down to 48 permit holders. I'm not sure how many permit hol holders are from Sheetka. Um, I think I was talking to a friend, there's maybe 11, but then you count all of the folks that come in and just like any extractive industry, you're bringing in people for, now the way the herring uh, fishery is, you know, used to used to be they might be able to get the herring in one or two days. Now these people from outside can be here for up to a month, and yeah, just like any extractive industry, it brings in people who have no connection to this place and no connection to the indigenous people. And from my experiences many years ago, it's it's not good when you have outsiders coming in and they're waiting to fish and they're going to the local bars and thinking that they have a right to everything here. Mm -hmm. That's pretty vague, but yes, it has had an effect. Thank you, Louise. Louisa, did you have anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, I just, I just would like to mention, I'm bringing you back from um, when I first spoke and, um, you know, of course, there's been such a negative impact on um, the herring fishery. Um, but 
you know, with the women and children going over and playing a huge part in occupying um, the DFO office, you know, um, inspiring many of our Celtic women to um, take their role, um, their, their role back within our community. And I did mention that, you know, um, there, we do have a matriarchs council now, um, a women's council who have signed on to the declaration of title and rights, you know, just, just bringing them back to their place in our governance system. And that is huge. You know, that is, that is huge to us because, you know, the herring, the herring and every species, you know, within the waters and the animals on the land, you know, have so much more meaning to, to, you know, us as Indigenous, you know, it's just, it's just not about the fishing and selling the SOK. It's about, you know, our, our creation stories and what, you know, the specific herring mean to us and what, you know, different species mean to us. And yeah, I, I just also wanted to mention too that I work with, you know, domestic and sexual violence within our nation. And, um, you know, right from 2015, I've seen many young women, you know, rise and, you know, become into the forefront and start, you know, standing up for women's rights, um, you know, within our nation, not only with our nation, but all over BC, you know, so, you know, it's uh, building that confidence and giving that support and letting the women take their place, their rightful place back in the governance system is huge. Great, thank you, Louisa. And Saul, just to let everyone know, Saul had to leave. He has another engagement, so he had to leave the Zoom. Um, I have, um, I'll go to one more question in the chat and then to, um, we have a couple of people who have their, their hands raised. So this is from, and I hope I'm getting your name right, Mikhail. Uh, Mikhail asks, do you think that ceremonies honoring herring or salmon are important in this complex context surrounding indigenous claims to rights relative to fisheries management? What is or are the roles of ceremonies and cultural or spiritual resurgence in this context? And uh, he addressed his question to Louise and Vina. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, as in the, so I love the quote, I can't remember um, it exactly, but um, yeah, looking at stories as original instruction. Um, I think we, we really need to move back to that, um, that these are our original instructions as to how are we to live with all of our relatives, whether they're in the ocean or in the land. And coming with, you know, our ceremonies as Tengit people, what we call Kui, basically it is, it's all relational. It's like, you know, we invite our relatives, we invite those who, whom we respect, who we are related to, whether it's through clan and it, those of you who have a clan system, pretty much, you know, I'm related to all the ravens, we have Moyeti, and probably to a majority at some point of all of the opposite. In, in our our way of life. And so um, when we are in ceremony, that's what it is. It's like we're in relation with our ancestors. We're carrying out the original instruction that they've carried out for so many years, managing this land in a way that it has been so plentiful and continue, continues to be plentiful, as well as you know those yet to come. And I found a great quote um, from one of the elders. So we have Atu, this is Atu, and I love this, this robe of the herring lady. And I tell people, you know, uh, yeah, I get really emotional because I, my hope is that my great, great, great granddaughter will say, yes, I remember a time when my great grandmother fought for us to have herring. And that's why we have herring today. And the quote said, you know, when we bring out our atu, it is not, um, we are acknowledging the legacy that they are here with us. And we are acknowledging all of the words that they have said. And, you know, 
we bring our adu out to these herring ceremonies that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. And so we are fulfilling our responsibilities in ceremony and saying that, you know, yes, this is our responsibility. This is our responsibility to protect the herring and we do not take this lightly. And the, I have to say that the response to the one in 2018 was pretty overwhelming. We started getting, I started getting phone calls and messages going, can we come next year? Can we come next year? And almost um, everybody that hears about it is like, they, you know, they want to come and they want to help celebrate the herring. So uh, absolutely, I think uh, it's the way that we acknowledge those relationships to the herring and to our ancestors and those yet to come. You are all invited April 22nd or April 16th. Please come to Shitka. Shitka, mm. thank you. Yeah, I, I, that was beautiful, Louise. So true. Um, definitely, 100%. Um, our ceremonies have sustained us, and, and it's, it's the evidence is there. Um, oftentimes, in this modern, fast paced world, we forget our ceremonies and we're wondering why we feel disconnected or we feel like, um, you know, uh, feel like maybe things aren't working or maybe the salmon aren't coming back. Our salmon, like, like we said, it was our first instruction, the first salmon ceremony. So many tribes have that, right? Because our, our groups have that because that connected us with the salmon people. It was a, it was a, an instruction on how to interact with another group of people, the salmon people, and how to, to, to do that in a respectful way. Um, the new Hulk in Bella Coola recently, their Uligan count was down. They have Uligans, this, that small fish that they make Uligan grease out of was dwindling, right? They were, they, and that was a mate, like, man, we trade for, with them herring eggs. They don't have, get herring eggs that we trade for the grease because we don't get Uligans. Mm -hmm. And um, they were becoming, de they were devastated. And then I think it was a few years ago, if you look it up, they, it was in the news, the New Hulk or Bella Coola have ceremony to honor Uligans. They created, they, they carved a pole, they did a ceremony. Now they do it every year and the Uligans came back. They returned to the river. And so it's not just some hokey, you know, um, things, even if you don't believe in that worldview, like our, I really like, this is where I have a hard time as an academic and I'm sure Charlotte can relate. The, the metaphysical, the supernatural part of writing about this, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, even if you look at like, um, you know, an Einstein quote is like the more Einstein studied the universe, the more he believed in a higher power. Like there's just some things that we can't explain. And there's, and we, our ancestors understood that. And that's why we had our ceremonies because it connected us to that supernatural fit, metaphysical stuff that we can explain and kept us rooted in that so that we weren't, thinking that we just become so in this world that we just become so obsessed with money and um, work and this, and it rooted us back to like, no, we're part of nature and our ceremonies remind us of that. And they root us in that. And then they connect us, they quiet us down, right? Mindfulness meditation is becoming more of a thing here in the West that comes from the East. Our ceremonies are part of that for us. If anything, they re clear our minds, remind us of our connection. They make us better people, more coherent, more cohesive, clear us. And then I'm talking bare minimum, right? And then there's this beautiful metaphysical part that roots us and it's the why we do what we do. So yeah, like it's not just some hokey thing. It's to remind us of our original instruction, like Louise said, and um, it's our guides and it's the way we do things. And sometimes, honestly, if we don't do it, we could lose that relationship right and we could lose that connection and then we'd be really screwed <laughs> right mm -hmm. and so we kind of um one thing that our people really do that's um kind of holding the line and to quote my dad he always used to say that mm -hmm. we've been holding the line if you're, you know it's like a fishing term holding the line for this society forever and we're tired of it right like we've been holding the line and our ceremonies do that and it's it's always a sacrifice the ceremonies we don't do it like a lot of our ceremonies are about physical sacrifice they're hard work where people work hard the sundance for the plains people the hopis do ceremonies every day like and we're holding that metaphysical spiritual line for the rest of society and it's just like when are you guys going to get it that 
this world can't just run on money, that there's more to it here. And our stories helped explain that. And our ceremonies were physical manifestations of that relationship. I'll just leave that there. Definitely. But go. Cool. Thank you, Vina. And it makes me think about to our philosophy, our new channel philosophy that grounds who we are as new channel that everything is interconnected, everything is one. And it also makes me think about your um, uncle, right? Umik is your uncle, you, you and Saul's uncle, right? And the book that he wrote, um, Umik, um, uh, Richard Atlio wrote a beautiful book called Zawak that looks at the these connections that we have to the other world, this, these metaphysical connections we have to the spiritual world that we're all one. There's no division between these worlds, our world, the natural world and the spiritual world. <clears throat> so it made me think about that by now when you were talking. Well, I have one more question I want to get to in the chat and then I'll go to um, Frederick and we might go a little bit over, but I wanted to get to Josh's question. And I don't know, I know Saul is, has left now. So if anyone else wants to speak to this legal question, Josh, my colleague has a um, question. What do you see are some of the opportunities and challenges emer emerging from recent court decisions, especially the intersections of the DeSoto decision, recognizing the Aboriginal rights of native communities outside Canada with the recent Ahousat case, and Ahousat is one of our new channel communities, the stronger assertion of commercial fishing rights. And he's thinking about this with the importance of cross-border management rights of tribal nations. If anyone wants to speak to that. Um, I can try. I mean, man, I'm mad at Saul for leaving early. Just kidding. <laughs> He's my little brother, so I can I can say <laughs> <take> that. <laughs> but I know he's really busy and he works really hard, so he needs to. His time is pretty um, mapped out. Um, so I'm not too familiar, but I'm just gonna say this one thing that I because I live transboundary, right? Like I live right up there, you know, and I'm Canadian First Nations. And one thing that I've been really seeing is that there are there is more potential, especially with those cases. And Saul kind of already spoke to this, so it, like it'd be really it would have been nice if he's here to kind of wrap that in a little tighter is that how we can help each other. And I really think that that's something that we're kind of missing because of colonialism, because that border just cut us right off from each other. It's in the treaties, right? If you've read the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855, we'll no longer trade with Canadian First Nations or Canadian Indians, like right there, the same Salish and speaking people right over there. And so like, it was really intentional and it was really, you know, like the, the treaties and the law. And I think it goes back to like, and I'm not, I'm just gonna kind of keep it broad here because I don't want to speak on something I don't know as much about. But one thing I personally been thinking about is um, from the jurisprudence, like, cause the tribes are so different, right? Like I know actually a lot more about in, um, the law down here when it comes to tribal sovereignty than up there because I did my education down here. Um, and there is ways that we could work better together to assert our own sovereignty that nation to nationhood, right? And in um, 2014, uh, we hosted Gatawas, which was the canoe journeys, and all the tribal leaders that were there, whether they were from Canada or the US, got together and created a Gatawas Accord, which was an agreement to work together um, across nations, nation to nation without the border. And I know that we have to deal with that border and the the so-called sovereignty of both these two states. But I think that there's something there about the more we, we strengthen our sovereignty and that we stop acting like, um, not that to say put down anyone's doing that, but you know, colonialism hammered us hard and reasserting our self-determination and our rights, then we sh shouldn't feel bad about trying to work together right? Whether it's trading, this and this. And I think canoe journeys, like it's a more social aspect, but canoe journeys is a great example of that. We don't go check in when we paddle across that water. We don't go in. They try to make us one year. We were paddling. And I know this is kind of going off topic, but it's just an example of like a tra trans boundary way of acknowledging we go to the shore and we ask permission to come ashore for the tribe, not for the U.S., Right. And if we could assert some more of that type of thinking and that type of 
um, transboundary behavior that our ancestors did forever before that border was put there and implement that, obviously throw some legal jargon in there and find ways that we can create more um, frameworks or courts to work together transboundary it would be so much better because I just feel like we're not doing it as as much as we sh we could because we really could especially with this issue could really help each other right and so yeah and you know what we look at those other cases Sparrow really impacted us the Housing court case is going to impact us and other tribes like so it's all interconnected right when we were going to court like it's all that precedent that's Kate court precedent that's built on top of each other um, but from a nationhood standpoint, you know, I think we just need to re recognize each other's nationhoods and go from there and not even ask permission on how we're going to deal with the border. Let's just do it. Like, that's my thinking. I know it's easier said than done. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do we, we, we're right at the end of our, um, our time, but do our, any of the other panelists want to say a few words before we, we close? And sorry for the people that who we didn't get to your, your questions. Apologize. I would just really like to um, again, Gorshish, thank you for this opportunity, and um, I really do hope that. Um, well, okay, we will extend a formal invitation uh, to our relatives to our ceremony in April, and do what we can to to get you here and. Uh, you know, it's, um, I, I think this is, this came at a really good time. I mean, there's, I think we need to do, I, I agree, we need to do this more. You know, like I said, right now, we're right in the middle of our local advisory committee, and then we have the Board of Fish meeting come up, coming up in January. And, um, you know, uh, the border and so many other things, I think, have, have made it really difficult for us to work together. So it's been, such an honor to be here um, with our relatives. And Gonafchish, thank you for doing all the work to get this together. Gonafchish, for the work that you uh, are currently doing to assure that, you know, yes, our under United Nations, our human rights are, are protected and recognize that, you know, we do have these rights to food sovereignty and to continue our sacred relationship not only um, you know, with each other as relatives, but all of our relatives, in the, whether they're in the ocean or on the land. So kind of cheesh. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Tlaco. Anyone else from our panel? We might have lost some of our other panel. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. This was wonderful, absolutely wonderful panel, wonderful speakers. I'm, I'm inspired and empowered by all the beautiful words that were shared today. I thank all of our attendees. I know some people have left, but I really appreciate you all coming today and uh, listening and opening your hearts to what was being said, what was being shared. And go to the UW Canadian Studies Program and all the sponsors for this very, very important event. I hold and raise my hands to all of you. It was really, really powerful sitting in this space with all of you today and taking in all of this very important knowledge that we can now take back with us and share that with others. So it really, really was um, uh, a, a great joy being here today. So Pleco, Ushak Shetleyetsu, thank you everyone. It was wonderful. Take care everyone. Yes, Be safe. You. Be safe. Thank you. thank you, Charlotte. And if anyone thank didn't you. get to ask a question but wants to, feel free to email Canada at uw.edu and we will forward your questions along to the panelists uh, to see if they're able to respond because I know that we ran long and didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, I also put in the chat the link that Ben shared earlier to the event that Louise and the Herring Protectors are putting on tonight. If you'd like to watch uh, the screening of their documentary, which is beautiful and fabulous, and um, make comments for their upcoming meeting with the Alaska Board of Fish, please join them if you have time. Um, and as always, you can reach out to us at the Canadian Studies Centre if you 
uh, have more questions. Um, and we really look forward to hosting more events like this. We're excited to keep working on these issues um, with our new partners and, and community members here. So thank you all for coming and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. <laughs>